I was being very selfish. I got caught up in interesting questions relating to my presentation, so I forgot that I was actually, my duties are not over for the day. I'm also the chair for, for this uh, very interesting s uh, session dealing with contractual issues. And I would say contractual issues are, we are now in an era where we enter into more contracts than ever before. Uh, every app you download or whatever requires you to enter into contracts. And it, what's interesting for me as someone dealing with cross-border issues, we enter into more contracts now than ever with provisions nominating a foreign court and a foreign law to be applicable. And that's significant too. Uh, although for Europe we've had this wonderful uh, Amazon and Verein for Consument Information case that might be affecting that quite severely, hopefully long term. But for the rest of the world, we are, uh, can't benefit from that. Now, contracts then are in the data protection setting. There's one thing, I'll be brief because I want you to hear from the real experts, but there's one thing that I want to bring up, and that is r consent. Consent is, uh, of course, in a sense, a contractual mechanism uh, and a very core principle or, or approach in data privacy law. In a sense, consent works as the miracle cure for all sorts of privacy violations. And, and in my view, consent is very much like a fairy tale creature. We can all describe a unicorn, we all know what it is, we have an agreement as to what it is, but we also know that it isn't real. And it's the same thing with consent. We describe it, we talk about it as if it existed, but it doesn't exist really. Because we consent, there's no, very rarely any informed consent, as, uh, 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 as was alluded to before, too. But I'm going to hand over to the speaker, who is Alex Mills, who, uh, through my research, I found out, we actually, we had never met, but we have had email contacts before, and he's helped me with my work, so I'm very grateful and, uh, and happy to have opportunity to meet Alex. Uh, and I'll let him introduce himself, uh, the details. Uh, but I want to say that uh, we couldn't have a better speaker on this topic, and, and uh, I welcome Alex to the podium. Excellent. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, um, and uh, uh, thank you very much to the conference organizers for the opportunity to be here today and to uh, speak to you on this topic. Um, so I'm talking about contractual issues in online social media. And if we're talking about contractual issues in social media, we might distinguish between vertical and horizontal questions. So we have questions to do with the relationship between social media organizations and their users, and also questions concerning the relationship between social media users. Um, now I'm going to focus uh, principally on the vertical issues in this presentation. If I have time, I might say something about the horizontal issues as well, but I'll talk principally about the vertical aspect. Now, if we talk about these uh, vertical issues, the um, very first point I want to make is a question about data protection law, which we've already heard a bit about today. Um, my presentation is about the private law issues. It's a classical private international law approach to these questions. In many cases, some of the claims that we're going to, look, uh, are going to be looking at um, are claims that could be made more powerfully through data protection law. Uh, and this is quite important. Um, the scope of data protection law is not based on classical private international law principles, as we've heard, um, but on the terms of the regulation itself. Now, however satisfactory or unsatisfactory we find the terms of the regulation specifying its application, um, that's a very important thing to note, that data protection law could encompass uh, many claims which might traditionally be brought in contractual or sometimes tortious form, uh, things like misuses of private information. Um, and um, I know that speaking to uh, some practitioners in London, um, they view data protection law as potentially opening up a very important um, way of uh, framing their claims, um, which gives them much more powerful jurisdictional possibilities than the traditional private international law framework. Um, so I think that's an area that's very important um, to look at. Um, but I'm not going to be talking about data protection law, I'm talking about the sort of classic private international law perspective. So the very first question that we have to ask, um, I'm taking Facebook as my, uh, as my sort of uh, case study here um, for uh, a social media organization. The question is, who is Facebook? Um, and the challenge that I'm talking about here is the difficulty of identifying the 
correct defendant in legal proceedings. Um, and I want to highlight here two cases, one case from the English courts and one from the Australian courts. Um, the English case is the case of Richardson and Facebook from 2015. So it's not a contractual claim, um, but it, il it illustrates the difficulties uh, of interacting with an organisation like Facebook, particularly for self-represented litigants, um, for non-lawyers. So the claimant in this case alleged that a fake profile had been made in her name on Facebook, and that fake profile had posted personal information about her and various salacious allegations about her private life. Uh, she complained to Facebook, the, f the profile was taken down, it reappeared again a week later, it was taken down again, but in the meantime, it, it, it had uh, been sort of hoovered up by various search engines, so the results still appeared um, online. So she, she commenced proceedings for libel and uh, breach of uh, Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights. She commenced proceedings against Facebook. Uh, that's who she listed as the defendant. Now, she notified Facebook UK that she was suing Facebook, and Facebook UK came to the English courts and asked for the proceedings to be dismissed. Um, and they were dismissed for uh, a couple of reasons. First of all, because Facebook is not a legal entity. Uh, and second of all, because Facebook UK is not responsible for the content of Facebook. Facebook UK is only responsible for, quote, public relations, consultancy, and communications for Facebook. Now, it wasn't really argued in this case whether another Facebook company could or should be substituted as a defendant. Um, the court didn't really suggest this to uh, the claimant. Um, I note that uh, the year after this case, the claimant was actually subject to a civil restraining order for being a vexatious litigant. Um, so it may be that uh, the court was uh, unsympathetic to this particular claimant. Um, the uh, next case that I want to talk about, Young and Facebook Australia, um, is in some ways similar. Um, so Mr Young created a uh, political discussion group in Australia, a discussion uh, page on Facebook. He was removed as administrator of the page by Facebook and asked to prove his identity. Now, he commenced proceedings against Facebook, um, asking to be reinstated. Uh, he was, in fact, reinstated, but he continued the proceedings asking for an order uh, that Facebook would not remove him again in the future. Uh, and also, um, uh, um, basically um, complaining about the fact that he'd been asked to prove his identity, which he, didn't, which he thought was uh, um, a requirement that shouldn't have been imposed on him. He commenced proceedings against Facebook Australia, which he named as the defendant. Uh, now, in this case, he was advised that Facebook Australia is not a legal entity, and proceedings have to be commenced against a legal entity. And he was given permission to change the um, defendant to Facebook Australia Pty Ltd. Uh, and so he sued Facebook Australia Pty Ltd. He sought to add Facebook Ireland and Facebook Incorporated, the US company, as uh, additional parties for reasons that um, will become clear in a second. Facebook Australia sought to strike out the proceedings and they were successful. And essentially, the same point was decided. Facebook Australia does not run Facebook. It is only responsible for, and I quote, public relations, consultancy, and communications. Uh, the exact same phrase, of course, that was used um, in the English proceedings. Again, the question of whether Facebook Ireland or Facebook Incorporated, the US company, could be sued in Australia was not really pursued in this case. The proceedings were dismissed on the basis that the claim had no prospect of success. So who, who should we be suing if we sue Facebook? Well, the starting point is section 18, subsection 1 of the Facebook Terms and Conditions. Uh, and those terms uh, tell us that if you're a resident or have your place of business in the US or Canada, your contract is with Facebook Incorporated. If, on the other hand, uh, you are anywhere else, your contract is with Facebook Ireland Limited. Um, and all terms in the contract are to be understood as references to um, the relevant party. So 
Canada and US contract with the US company. The rest of the world contracts with Facebook Ireland. The next question we might ask is uh, the question of jurisdiction. So which court should or would have jurisdiction if we want to sue Facebook? The starting point again is Facebook's terms and conditions, section 15, subsection one in relevant part, is essentially an exclusive jurisdiction agreement in favor of the courts of California. Uh, you can sue in potentially state or federal courts, depending on what the issues might be, but the exclusive jurisdiction agreement is in favor of the Californian courts. Note that this applies even if your contract is with Facebook Island. Um, you're required to sue Facebook Island in California. If you're in the UK and you have a contractual dispute with Facebook, the jurisdiction agreement says that you must sue Facebook Island, but you must sue them in the United States. Is the jurisdiction agreement effective? Well, obviously this is gonna depend on the different national jurisdictional rules of different countries around the world. I'm gonna focus, first of all, on uh, the European Union here. And an initial po point that we can uh, note quite quickly, of course, you can enter into jurisdiction agreements through click-through contracts, um, simply through clicking I agree online. This was confirmed by the Court of Justice in the Cars on the Web case, uh, that the mere possibility of creating a permanent record of the terms and conditions establishes uh, or meets the formality requirements of Article 25 of the Brussels One Regulation applying to jurisdiction agreements. Uh, so what about the effectiveness of a US jurisdiction agreement under EU jurisdictional rules? For claims against European Union, well, if we were dealing with a claim against a non-EU party, this would be a matter of national law. Um, and it would be something that we would uh, look at the different uh, laws of the different member states. But mostly in the European Union, we're gonna be dealing with claims against Facebook Island. So we're dealing with a, a, a company that's domiciled in the European Union, in, in an EU member state. So the question of whether this jurisdiction agreement is effective depends on the question of the effectiveness of non-member state exclusive <coughs> jurisdiction agreements under the Brussels One Regulation. Now for the private international lawyers in, in the room, this is of course the famous Owusu and Jackson problem. It's the problem of the reflexive effect of Article 25 of the Brussels One Regulation. This is a problem because Article 25 of the Brussels One Regulation says that exclusive jurisdiction agreements are effective, but it only deals with jurisdiction agreements in favor of the courts of member states. The Brussels One Regulation is completely silent on exclusive jurisdiction agreements in favor of non-member states, except now for a small mention in the rules on Liz Pendens dealing with prior proceedings in non-member states, um, which has slightly muddied the waters um, under the recast regulation um, since last year. Uh, so the question of whether or not this jurisdiction agreement is effective at all um, raises immediately some of the most difficult questions of jurisdiction uh, in private international, uh, in um, European uh, law. The next question we might ask is whether Facebook users are consumers, because under the Brussels Run Regulation, consumers get special protection. Uh, in fact, consumers can't enter into exclusive jurisdiction agreements in certain circumstances. If we look at Article 17 of the Brussels One Regulation, we find that there are two key elements um, identified here. First of all, there's a definition of consumer, uh, parties acting outside their trade or profession. And second of all, there's a requirement for the uh, relevant party to be directing their activities to the member state of the consumer. Now, we can deal with the Second of these requirements first, the requirement for directing activities. On this issue, the Court of Justice has given us some guidance uh, in um, joint cases, uh, PAMA and Hotel Alpenhoff. Um, on the question of when a trader is directing their activities to a consumer's domicile online, um, is it enough to have a website? The court said no. There has to be something more than just a website. Uh, but the court didn't set out a very precise test 
for how directing activities works online. There are a range of factors which must be taken into account. The question is, did the company have an intention to solicit the custom of the consumers of a particular state? You can take into account the nature of the activity, the use of a, of a uh, country-specific top-level domain, use of different languages or currencies, so on and so forth. Uh, the directing of activities can be immediate or it can be through an agent. So uh, in this case, the fact that Facebook UK looks after communications for Facebook doesn't mean that Facebook isn't carrying out, uh, isn't directing its activities towards the UK. On balance, it's highly likely that Facebook satisfies this test in relation to every jurisdiction where it carries out its business. Uh, I don't think this is a too difficult a question to satisfy. But let's come back to the first question. When is a person using Facebook for a purpose which can be regarded as being outside his trade or profession? What about an academic who uses Facebook as a social network, but also shares news of new publications or an upcoming conference? Are they using Facebook for uh, um, outside their trade or profession? Well, obviously, they're partly doing one and partly doing the other. So then the question is, um, what happens if we're dealing with uh, activity which is mixed? And here we have, again, guidance from the Court of Justice of the European Union in the Gruber and Baywa case. The benefit of the consumer protection provisions cannot, as a matter of principle, be relied on by a person who concludes a contract for a purpose which is partly concerned with his trade or profession and is therefore only partly outside it. So if you use Facebook partly for professional purposes, you are not a consumer for any purposes, according to this test, unless your use for professional purposes is so slight as to be marginal, has only a negligible role. So it seems that in some circumstances, Facebook users will be consumers and won't be subject to these exclusive jurisdiction agreement, but in other circumstances, Facebook uh, users are not going to satisfy the test for a consumer and will be subject to the exclusive jurisdiction agreement in favour of the Californian courts, presuming that we have uh, the reflexive effect of non-member state exclusive jurisdiction agreements. Outside the context of the European Union, I wanted to mention um, a recent decision of the Supreme Court of Canada uh, in the case of Duez and Facebook on quite similar issues. The issue in this case was, is the jurisdiction agreement in Facebook's terms and conditions effective against Canadians? This case arose out of a Facebook advertising product called Sponsored Stories, under which Facebook used the name and picture of Facebook members to advertise companies and products to other Facebook members. So you'd see an advertisement for a particular product, and next to that advertisement would be a picture of your friend on Facebook telling you, buy this product, particularly sort of insidious uh, product, uh, insidious type of advertising, I think. Um, so Facebook was subject to a class action in Canada, is subject to a class action, uh, under, British Columbia, uh, under a British Columbia privacy statute, a breach of privacy claim. And the question was, did the jurisdiction agreement in favour of the Californian courts prevent the action? The court held by a majority of four to three that the jurisdiction agreement was ineffective. The court held that uh, this was the case for a number of reasons, and it's a little bit difficult to unpack what the real ratio of the case was. So one of the reasons was there was gross inequality of bargaining power between the parties. Individual consumers in this context are faced with little choice but to accept Facebook's terms of use. That on its own doesn't seem um, that it ought to be enough. And one of the judges who concurred in the majority judgment actually emphasised the unfairness of the jurisdiction agreement as being an additional important factor. It's not enough that it wasn't not negotiated, it's that it was actually highly unfair and highly inconvenient to Canadian um, consumers. It also appears significant from the judgment that the case involved a privacy statute and potentially constitutional questions in Canada, um, although it's unclear again how significant uh, this aspect of the case was. 
so the court said that Canadian courts have a greater interest in adjudicating cases impinging on constitutional and quasi-constitutional rights because of the role of those rights in Canadian society. Uh, and only the Canadian court's decision would provide um, certainty and clarity about the scope of the rights. Uh, so in the Canadian courts, we've seen also um, challenges to the validity of uh, the choice of court agreements in Facebook's terms and conditions. Moving on to choice of law, which is the next private international law question we have to ask ourselves. What law governs your contract with Facebook? Uh, again, the starting point here is, of course, party autonomy and Facebook's terms and conditions. Article 3 of the Rome 1 regulation says that you can ordinarily choose the law to govern your contracts. And Facebook's terms and conditions in, again, section 15, subsection 1 says, the laws of the state of California will govern this statement as well as any claim that might arise between you and us without regard to conflict of law provisions. Um, Note that this choice of law rule applies even if your contract is with Facebook Island. Uh, so your contract is with Facebook Island, but your choice of law and jurisdiction uh, is in favor of California. Now, again, we have to ask whether consumer protection, the, the sort of consumer protection sort of restrictions in the choice of law rules um, invalidate this choice or limit the effectiveness of this choice. And here, what's interesting is that the Rome 1 regulation takes a slightly different approach in Article 6. It doesn't say that you can't choose foreign law to govern a consumer contract, but it says that the effectiveness of that choice can't essentially make the consumer, the effect of that choice can't make the consumer worse off. Um, so it's a slightly different uh, approach. Um, but again, we have the same question of whether Facebook users are consumers. And the test for that uh, question under the Rome 1 regulation is essentially the same as the test that applies under the Brussels 1 regulation. So I won't say anything more about that. Um, but uh, those same issues arise uh, in, when people are using Facebook for mixed purposes. If a choice of law agreement is not effective, there's another um, important point to note. Um, it was a, a point that uh, uh, Dan mentioned before, actually. Um, the, that further aspects of consumer law can come into play. Uh, and this is the Verein uh, für um, Konsumenten Information and Amazon um, decision of the European Court of Justice. Um, this was a claim for unfair competition based on Amazon using standard terms and conditions which were contrary to EU uh, consumer protection rules. And um, part of the Part of Amazon's standard terms and conditions in these contracts was a choice of law clause that said in their contracts that all uh, contracts with Amazon were governed by the law of Luxembourg, in fact. And uh, the Court of Justice held, first of all, that this, was, that this choice could not be effective to deprive consumers of the protection of their home law because of the consumer protection provisions under the Rome 1 regulation. And therefore, the choice of law clause in the contract was itself misleading and unfair because it was a misrepresentation as to the applicable law of the contract. Um, that's a very interesting and powerful uh, decision. It suggests that companies can't just try and insert a choice of law clause and then see if it works or not in the courts. They have to actually make an evaluation of what the applicable law is going to be, taking into account consumer protection provisions. We actually see some similar decisions in other jurisdictions as well. Um, in uh, the case of the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission and Valve Corporation, um, this was a claim in the Australian courts brought against uh, a US company um, which uh, distributes online games. Um, and uh, their terms and conditions had a choice of Washington state law, uh, exclusive jurisdiction agreement in favor of Washington state courts. And their terms provided that consumers um, could be given no refunds whatsoever in any circumstances for any online purchases. Now, the Australian court held that those clauses were ineffective in reference to claims made under, consumer protect, uh, under Australian consumer law. Uh, and in fact, Australian consumers had the right to bring 
claims in Australian courts under that law, and therefore the choice of law and the choice of jurisdiction clauses were misleading representations as to the rights of Australian consumers. Uh, and there's some similar authority which makes uh, similar arguments in the US as well, um, going back a little bit to America Online um, and uh, the Superior Court in California. Californian consumers have the right to sue in California and a choice of court, a choice of law agreement in favour of Virginia was ineffective and a misrepresentation of the rights of Californian consumers. <coughs> Now, it's worth noting that Facebook seems to have at least some passing awareness of these issues because of a particular provision. Uh, in section 16 of Facebook Terms and Conditions, there's a, um, particular, uh, there's, a, there's a subsection 3 which says that certain specific terms that apply only for German users are available here, and there's a hyperlink to a page of separate German Terms and Conditions. Uh, the problem here is that some of the protections set out in the German terms and conditions are actually protections based on EU consumer protection law uh, and not German domestic law. And there's no reason why Germany should be singled out in this way except that Facebook seems to be particularly sort of have taken notice of the German courts. <laughs> in these German terms and conditions, um, there's a paragraph five which says that Section 15, subsection 1 of the uh, Facebook Terms and Conditions, which is the choice of law clause, is replaced by this statement is subject to German law. So in other words, if you're in Germany, your contract with Facebook is actually governed by German law, whether or not you're a consumer. So if you're an academic in Germany who uses Facebook for professional purposes, your contract is with Facebook Island. You can only sue them in California, and the Californian courts have to apply German law. <laughs> it's like Facebook are trying to come up with work for private international lawyers. Now, I've been discussing these cases from a purely private law framework, and this is the way that the courts are predominantly um, looking at them. But I did want to note, uh, before I finish, some arguments which have been raised um, in a number of these cases about whether this is right, whether the private law framework is enough to deal with what's really going on here. In the case of Richardson and Facebook, for example, the claimant was arguing that Facebook had breached their European Convention rights. Now, the basis for this claim is the Human Rights Act in the UK, and that and the Human Rights Act says that it's unlawful for a public authority to act in a way which is incompatible with a convention right. The argument that the claimant made in this case was that Facebook UK might be considered a hybrid public authority and therefore liable to be sued under the Human Rights Act. Now, a hybrid public authority is any person certain of whose functions are functions of a public nature. And it was alleged that, it was claimed that Facebook UK provides a public service and acts in the public interest and therefore was a public authority. Now this was dismissed pretty quickly by the court. Uh, a public authority is an entity that acts on behalf of the people as a whole, not for private purposes, and Facebook is a private party. I think what's interesting about this is that it's quite different from the way Facebook presents itself uh, as being uh, an organisation that acts in the interests of its community, of its users. Um, rather, than being, uh, rather than being a corporation that is, of course, ultimately acting in its own self-interest. We saw some similar arguments in the case of Young and Facebook Australia, um, the other case that I mentioned before. Um, Mr Young claimed that requiring him to establish his identity was contrary to his rights of free speech. Uh, it was raising this interesting issue about whether political free speech requires a right to anonymity in political communication. The court held that the implied constitutional right of free speech in Australia does not carry with it a cause of action against private or corporate entities which are not part of government, essentially. Um, so the political right of free speech in Australia is only actionable against the state. 
in terms of uh, regulations which restrict free speech. Now, I think this is um, quite an interesting question. Uh, given the significant role that we've all seen Facebook play in recent elections in the US, in Brexit referendum in the UK, uh, is, can you really say that the, the, that the sort of necessity of, um, of uh, free speech to ensure a functional democracy can't apply to private entities like Facebook, which provide a majorly important communications infrastructure? If Facebook decided that it would only show ads from one political party in an election campaign, would that really be compatible with the rights of free speech in a democracy? Um, again, Facebook is, uh, the, the, the sort of classic analysis here is a purely private law framework. Um, but you can see in the cases the beginnings of some perhaps questions being raised about whether that's right. Uh, final point just very quickly, Facebook has various internal dispute resolution processes. Um, reporting requirements, if you think your, uh, your privacy rights have been breached, if your um, intellectual property rights have been breached, whatever it might be. Um, it's an interesting question that we might ask about what effect those requirements might have on your possibility to sue. Uh, could those requirements be viewed, for example, as something like a mediation clause, a condition precedent to litigating? Could a company make it compulsory to use their internal dispute resolution processes before um, you, you're able to sue them uh, in the courts? Um, there's actually some, some authority which, su which suggests that that might be possible. Uh, although what it seems to involve is accepting that Facebook provides something like uh, private administrative law processes um, for its own uh, services. And that would be, I, I think, another leap um, that uh, perhaps we've not quite made yet. Um, but uh, I think it also demonstrates again the, the, the idea that the sort of private law, pure private law model doesn't seem to be entirely capturing what's really going on um, in these interactions. So the um, reaction to this, I think, can be summed up with a couple of quotes. Uh, a quote from an organization called Squaring the Net. Facebook has become a sort of parallel justice with its own rules that we cannot fully understand. Um, sort of summarizes the difficulties uh, that people and organizations have in engaging with an organization as large uh, and as important as Facebook. Uh, but also a quote from Mark Zuckerberg um, in 2010, uh, who said, in a lot of ways, Facebook is more like a government than a traditional company. We have this large community of people, and more than other technology companies, we're really setting policies. So this was from a book in 2010, uh, I guess before his lawyers got hold of him. <laughs> so there are three, points, three main points that I want you to take away from this presentation. First of all, dealing with social media organizations raises some of the complexities involved in any dealings with multinational companies, uh, including having to work out which legal entity you're actually dealing with in any particular dispute. Now, this is not too, too challenging for us as trained lawyers, but it does obviously present a challenge for individual litigants, and we can see that in some of the cases. Second, social media organizations are naturally enough trying to simplify their legal environment by choosing choice of court, uh, including choice of court and choice of law clauses in their contracts. But whether or not those clauses are effective is in practice a highly complex question. Uh, it seems quite unrealistic that private international law regulates these issues with sufficient certainty um, to actually be helpful here, um, particularly given the different approaches to restricting party autonomy around the world and in the context of jurisdiction and choice of law. And the final point is that while this sort of vertical contracts can be analysed and in practice are analysed as purely private law issues, we can also see in the case law maybe the beginnings of an argument that a dominant social media provider like Facebook is less like a private company and more like a public utility. Facebook itself seems to understand that it has some kind of quasi-governmental role, at least in certain circumstances. So I think this is likely to be a very um, important area of contention in the future. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Alex. And I, it, please take a seat up here. Uh, I, I should have, of course, mentioned that Alex is from the University of College London, but most of you would be aware of his work anyway. And this is an advice for everyone organizing events. Don't let anyone with severe jet lag chair a session, because I'm doing a terrible job here. The next speaker is, uh, who's going to respond to Alex is, of course, Van Heike Schweitzer, who's a professor at the Freie University of Berlin, where she is the managing director of the Institute for German and European Economic Competition and Regulatory Law. So it's clearly a, a big, big area. Welcome. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, uh, Professor Hess, for the kind invitation. And this despite one problem that I now have, that probably in this room I'm the one person who knows least about internet, private international law. So I've learned a lot from Alex's very clear and interesting presentation, but I have a difficulty how to address it. Uh, so I hope you um, don't mind if I take uh, a somewhat different approach and look at some issues. I've dealt in my, uh, in my work, I've dealt more with the substantive law issues of contract and uh, social media platforms. So I will uh, want to comment on two specific aspects um, which have to deal with the interface between substantive law and conflicts of, uh, of laws. And these two issues are the following. First of all, I want to see whether we may be observing something which is an evolution towards a transnational private or contract law or consumer protection law in the field of um, social media platforms. So that maybe conflicts of laws doesn't even matter so much in the future. The second question I want to raise is regards the interaction of contract law and data protection law, because uh, on the social media platforms, the contracts, especially those where you pay with data, so to speak, have a strongly, strongly intertwine or mix issues of contract law and data protection law. So both of these comments relate to the vertical issues that um, Alex has also put into the front of his presentation. One comment also on the horizontal issues, um, yes, Platforms like, like uh, Facebook do take on a regulatory role. First of all, this is a pri uh, the role of a private regulator setting house rules. This, as such, can already raise the question whether there is a public dimension which we should address in a different way. Now, a different layer uh, comes is added to this, or has been added to this more and more recently. States have recognized the interesting, and, and uh, Gerald Spindler has commented on that, states have recognized that social media platforms do have such a nice a regulatory role anyhow, and that these intermediaries can be the addressees of additional public law duties. In such a case, what do we do now? Isn't this then, at least when we really have a hybrid function between public and private regulation, isn't this a case where then public law duties should apply to social media platforms like Facebook? But I won't um, address this question uh, more in depth, rather I will start with my first question, do we see an evolution towards transnational contract law, transnational con uh, consumer protection law in the field of social media platforms? Now, Ralf, Peter, Kallis and others have made that point. They have argued that in cyberspace we see such a trend towards transnational private law rules, including private consumer protection rules being set by platforms and the examples they used were e-commerce platforms. Now, e-commerce platforms, of course, have a strong self-interest in ensuring consumer confidence, and they have developed a number of interesting instruments in order to increase consumer confidence, namely formalized online reputation mechanisms like ratings of sellers, a safe payment systems which go through the platform, trust marks, code of conduct, and all of that in order to put pressure on sellers to act in a consumer-friendly way. And they have combined that with an, a very efficient, of some pl platforms at least, with a very efficient online dispute resolution mechanism, which is indeed very consumer-friendly and avoids many, or keeps many consumers from going to court, like Amazon, for example, would have such, uh, such a very attractive consumer um, online dispute resolution mechanism. <clears throat> 
Now, in such a case, indeed, we can see a different version, a different, a different institutional setting for consumer protection, which partly at least avoids national courts. Do we see something like that also in social, online social media? Now, if you look, first of all, look at the terms of services, all of these, I have looked at Facebook, Twitter, um, LinkedIn, Xing, all of those, basically all of them claim these services are valid over globally. They are valid across the world. So in a way, there seems to be the idea that they are setting a global, uh, not global law, but a glo global contractual contract terms. Also, interestingly, they frequently add that although they provide, for example, for a German language version of the terms of service, they will say that it's only the English version which is a terminative um, in case of conflict of interpretation. So this adds to the impression that they do want to have a global legal regime, and Alex has described that in more detail. Still, I would say um, social media platforms have, in the type of conflicts uh, I'm now looking at, a very different role uh, compared to e-commerce platforms. E-commerce platforms in, uh, ha are really intermediaries, intermediaries between buyers and sellers, and the conflicts that arose and those were, which can be handled in dispute resolution mechanisms are those between buyers and sellers, and, e uh, and the e-commerce platform then acts as a neutral uh, regulator in a way. The type of conflicts between consumers and the platform, uh, consumer, uh, that, that raise consumer protection issues that we see now between social media platforms, or, uh, that we see in the field of social media platforms, are those where we have a conflict between consumers and the platform itself. Now, in such a case, of course, a platform is a party, an interested party. It's not a neutral regulator. And uh, in the competition between social media platforms, the terms of service are not relevant. They don't have uh, an, a sufficient incentive to have very attractive, consumer-friendly terms of service because the competition between, between platforms is really a competition about quality parameters uh, and network effects. So the, the terms that Alex has already partly described are not, uh, are not very consumer-friendly either. We don't see a consumer protection regime, institutionalized consumer protection regime outside the national regime arising in this field. Looking at the dispute resolution also, yes, we do see dispute resolution regarding privacy data protection, but not regarding the terms of service of Facebook or other platforms. Most of these platforms would rather say, go to court. We have some, interestingly, WhatsApp and Instagram. They, have, they opt for the Federal Arbitration Act, so there is an arbitration regime there, but not Facebook and not most of the other platforms, which means they don't even try to avoid national courts. Rather, it's probably more attractive to, go, to let consumers go to court because the barrier to go to court is higher than the barrier to make use of an online dis dis uh, uh, dispute resolution regime. So my conclusion here is we don't see um, an evasion of national law, national, uh, we, we even see quite a number of cases before uh, national courts. We, uh, Alex has presented some. The reason why Facebook has the German clause in there probably is that the Landgericht Berlin and uh, the Kammergericht Berlin both have dealt with Facebook in various instances. So there has been some, uh, some um, uh, court litigation on, on Facebook terms of services. We, this means uh, that private international law will continue to play a role uh, with regard to social media platforms and their uh, contra terms of service, and also it means, uh, this is probably the explanation why the EU has tried to harmonize, or is trying to harmonize, um, contract law in this area by, um, we, well, we all have discussed for the last two years or so, the draft directed, uh, directive on digital content. While we don't see a national, a transnational contract law or consumer protection law arising, what we do see, however, is a new type of contract that is evolving and a contract for social media platforms which has specific features and a specific balancing of interests. And these specific features are of cross-border relevance. 
if we want to avoid friction in a system which still relies on territoriality, in that case, we should maybe not all apply the same law, but we should recognize the same features and take them into account in our substantive law. Now, some of the relevant features I would consider to be, first of all, when free services are provided, consumers pay with data. We can at least, they, they don't pay with money, they pay with data. But paying with data is not the same as paying with money, so there are specific contractual rights which become less meaningful in such a setting, for example, a price reduction remedy or also the termination of contract. Secondly, we have a very fluid, flexible, dynamic uh, provision of services. These services are in intense competition. They, are, they evolve uh, day by day, so to speak, and platforms, in order to prevail in this competition to be successful, have to ad adjust in, in a very flexible manner. If you look at the Facebook uh, terms of service, they reflect the situation by saying services are provided as is. There's no promise made as regards the fitness for purpose, no additional promises or applied or impl explicit guarantees, no, not even a promise of uninterrupted service or immediate service, and Facebook reserves all rights to change at any time or to end services at any time. Now we could say this is again proof of the unfairness of Facebook's contract terms. But maybe it's not. Maybe this is also a reaction to the very flexible type of service that Facebook and other social media platforms provide and the need in a very harsh competition to be flexible and adjust. Uh, so um, in, among platforms, you could say Facebook is such a prominent fl platform. Still, it does compete. And, and of course, Facebook benefits from strong direct network effects. But um, all the platforms, including Facebook, including so any social media platform, is very afraid of coordinated switching of consumers. And once a service becomes sufficiently innovative and attractive, such switching, coordinated switching, can take place. Um, normally, in normal bilateral contracts where you pay with money, consumers are in a way isolated in a bilateral relationship, and consumers react less to problems and discontent in other contractual relationships. But, but in social media, you have a strong degree of interconnection between the individuals and where discontent arises and becomes public in one relationship, it can, it can um, quickly have the effect of coordinated switching. So the most important remedy for consumer protection with regard to so social media platforms is competition, is switching, easy switching for consumers, which means you have to avoid, if you want to protect consumers, you have to avoid contractual lock-in and you have to make strong the portability remedy. Now the draft directive on digital content, uh, I would argue, neglects some of these special features of um, free services and social media platforms by wrongly presuming a regulatory equivalence between services for money and services for data. So the idea to really focus on contract conformity means you have to have a precise definition of service. But if you have very dynamic services, it becomes very difficult to have a precise definition of the service to be provided. And also, it's a focus on remedies like uh, termination, price reduction, which are not really fit for, for this uh, context. Rather, the, as I mentioned, the remedies to focus on are portability and probably a re regulation of the data price. I will say one sentence on that in a moment. So should the draft directive be passed, uh, this directive together with the existing conflicts of laws regime will create difficult tensions and it will te create tensions because, not because we have still national law, but because it misses the factual specificities of these services. So in that case, a platform like Facebook would need to drastically change the terms of service for the provision of services in the EU which means the services will become more costly and which what this will mean something. This will mean that the, uh, Facebook has in some ways to raise price and that would be probably the data price. Do we want that? Probably not. And more, more importantly even, uh, this is not to the advantage of social media users as a group because it may lessen innovation. It may lessen the dynamics of the platform. So it may, may be, uh, uh, what I would argue for is we can live in a world where contract with social media platforms are still governed 
by national contract law or EU contract law, for example, in the, so that can be different normative choices. But we should make sure that we have what we may call, call an overlapping consensus on the factual features of these services and what they require in terms of legal regulation. So very briefly, my second comment on the intertwinement between contract Oh, shall, shall I stop here? No, no, but if you want oh, to I just want concluding. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I, I just make one sentence. Yeah, yeah, for one sentence. Yeah. Okay. I, I can stop if you like. So the, the one sentence would be, in, we have uh, in uh, the social media um, platform area a contract on all the free services, um, in all the free services contracts, a special role for consent. Uh, consent is a contractual aspect, but consent is also regulated under data protection law. Now, consent, the validi val validity of consent under contract law may be governed by some law to be determined by private international law. The uh, validity of consent under data protection law is a different thing and is regulated under a different regime. We can now have a clash between data protection law and contract law. Data protection law will govern, but what will this mean? if then the contract can no longer be validly concluded by e European consumers. Thank, Thank you. you. Due to my, due to my uh, very poor work as chair, we have very limited uh, scope for questions, but I wonder if maybe we can take five minutes uh, extra. Would that be all right to you? you? I know you like to be on time here, but can we run over five minutes? or? Yes, so but one or two questions now. One or two questions, and only ones that can be answered yes or no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, questions. Uh, yeah. Hey, thank you. It's good private international lawyer, Gerhard Spindler, solved this problem by Renvoi, so Jan von Hein, University of, of Freiburg. I have two questions for, for Alex Mills. Um, Alex, the first question would relate to the impact of Gruber and Baiva. Um, as you know, this is not the most recent decision and I would say it's still good law, but one would probably have to take into account that in the Consumer Rights Directive, um, the European legislature has introduced a kind of balancing test which is more uh, generous to the consumer so we don't have this very restrictive approach uh, that the Court of Justice developed in Gruber uh, and Baiva in substantive European consumer law. So I would add a question mark to this, whether the European Court of Justice might, by way of some uh, systemic interpretation, reconsider this question in the future, because at the moment the private international law framework of consumer protection and the substantive law don't fit very well together because we have different tests for uh, mixed uh, contracts. So this is my first question, how you would view this problem. And another, que the, the second question would be um, with regard to the horizontal um, relationships between uh, users of social media. What impact might the uh, contract that both consumers or both users have with Facebook have on the relationship among themselves? Could we think perhaps of an accessory connection within the framework of the Rome 2 regulation? If we say, well, there's some kind of connection, no contra direct contract between the two users, but they both share a contract with the service provider, with Facebook, which is governed by the law of California. So could this have an impact on the relationship among themselves as well? Thank you. Uh, it's working, yes. Um, so in response to your first question, I, I just think Point taken, yes, I agree there is, a, uh, there is a tension here between the approaches in substantive uh, consumer protection law and the approach in the existing case law on um, consumer protection under uh, the jurisdictional rules. Um, and it would be nice if that could be revisited um, because I think the, uh, you know, I, I, I hopefully, you know, the, the examples that I've given sort of demonstrate that uh, these, these rules don't seem to work entirely satisfactorily um, for, at least for, um, systems like Facebook. Um, in terms of the, um, the the sort of added horizontal dimension, which I didn't really have time to talk about, um, obviously it introduces uh, great new complexities, and and part of those complexities might be the possibility that um, proceedings could be brought uh, both against Facebook and against um, uh, 
uh, another party that you can have some you know accessory jurisdiction principles being applied there um, depending on the circumstances um, the possibility of that may also depend on uh, the effectiveness of Facebook's disclaimers of uh, any responsibility in its terms and conditions, and that's, a, again, a substantive law question that, uh, um, that we would need to look at. Um, and the other aspect to talk about is that, um, in practice, disputes between users on Facebook um, are all resolved through Facebook's dispute settlement processes, really. I mean, people don't really go to court very often to sue each other over things that have been posted on Facebook they ask Facebook to take down the material. And Facebook decides whether or not that material should be taken down. And it, it reaches that decision actually not applying national law. It reaches that decision applying Facebook's own community standards. Uh, and so what's, what's also happening here is that Facebook's acting like a, a kind of transnational law provider um, to resolve these disputes as they arise between users. So that's another interesting sort of dimension to that. I would just like to ask or just give some brief comments on, on that because, well, it's one of my topics, <laughs> sorry. Um, just first to Alex, your, your presentation, oh, I, I agree absolutely with you, but still keep in mind that we have the audiovisual media directive and there, even in the new proposals, we have this little opaque provision concerning hate speech and so on and so on and so on. So there is already some sort of regulation there. Um, secondly, uh, what, what you have been talking about, all the implications, freedom of speech, etc., concerning the contracts, um, I would just remind you of the UPC telecable decision of the European Court of Justice. Okay, it concerns access provider liability, but here the court really strongly uh, laid stress on the trilateral, multilateral relationship between users of a network, or let's say of a provider, and uh, every kind, freedom of speech, etc., etc. So it's not only bilateral anymore, and he required the member states to introduce procedures, procedural law, Burkhardt, yeah, in order to guarantee these rights, but what we still do not have. Yeah, but this should apply also to contractual issues. Um, and just some short remarks uh, um, to Heike's, your, your presentation. Thanks a lot for that. Um, maybe, I do not know whether you've seen that in the GDPR, there is already a right of portability. You can claim for that. But the problem here, and we are discussing that, uh, I'm also in talks with the Estonian presidency you know, concerning that. This is now in the trilogue. Perhaps in two or three weeks the trilogues will start. Um, but the problem is, how do you transfer data which affects third parties? Because if you're putting out all communication of Facebook, just imagine that, to another social network, then every kind of discussion, questions, hints, etc., are just in a nirvana. There's nothing left. You cannot understand any more the communication. That was one of the main topics we had during the GDPR and this right of portability. How, what do you do about third parties uh, in, in this uh, area? And I think all what you pointed out, networks affect, this is more telecommunication regulation. We should extend that. It's not about broadcasting, but it's partly telecommunication and broadcasting. Okay, last point um, concerning platforms. I think you're a little bit over-optimistic. We've done empirical research about Check24, for example, which is a very prominent platform, for example, in Germany. Of course, there are incentives, but they have a lot of conflicts of interest because they're getting provisions from sellers, etc., and so they're playing sometimes tricks on you. And so maybe we should have also here regulation. But we, this is still something we really have to discuss. Um, for f for my part, I just want to say thank you for the comments. Did you want to? Uh... Just one brief sentence to the last point. I wouldn't argue in favor of not having any unfair contract terms control over terms of services by Facebook. Rather, as far as the range of services and the nature of the services are concerned, they are controlled by competition, not the rest, but just that. So thank you. So we, we, we've had quite a, a, a broad discussion of many fascinating topics today, and now we're going to try to wrap up in a, in a discussion round in which everyone will give a, a, just a brief comment, and uh, I think we'll, we'll throw it open then, more or less, to questions. Uh,
uh, after that and maybe have some discussion among ourselves too. Uh, do you have anything to add to the, the way we run this board card before oh, we start introducing people? I would say this was people? perfect and we should briefly uh, present the speakers uh, who have just uh, uh, joined us here at the podium. Uh, maybe you start with your side. Yes, so, so to my left, we're, we're very grateful. We have Henrik Saugmansgaard Ur, who I came to know as the Danish consumer ombudsman and he was kind enough to teach some sessions in a, in a course that I presented at Copenhagen University and he's now Advocate General here at the Court of Justice in Luxembourg. So thank you for making time, Henrik, from your schedule uh, to come here. We're very, very much appreciated. To my left is my colleague at the Brussels Privacy Hub, Professor uh, Gloria Gonzalez Fuster, a well-known figure in the privacy world, wrote a, a, a seminal text on the fundamental right uh, to data protection and has been involved in many European projects and with, with me is also in the expert group of the DG Justice on the GDPR. So I would like to present the two person sitting uh, to my right. Uh, to my right is sitting Christina Mariottini. She is a senior research fellow at the Max Planck Institute here in Luxembourg. And uh, she is also co-rapporteur of the ILA Committee on the Protection of Privacy. And uh, Kevin Benish has joined the panel too. He will bring in the American perspective. Kevin comes from New York. He uh, is working with Linda Silberman at uh, NYU. And uh, so I'm very happy that you came for a couple of days uh, to the Institute. And uh, this is part of a very fruitful cooperation between NYU and the Max Planck here. So I think we should start with... Uh, yes. uh, um, I think, Henrik, you could perhaps start and you have the floor. And the Thank you very much, <coughs> Christopher, and uh, thank you for inviting me to come here today. Uh, I've been Advocate General for two years, but it's actually the first time I, I come these 400 meters up the road to, to speak here, and I'm very pleased to be here today. Maybe I should, um, uh, regarding the last uh, session, uh, reminded me when I was consumer ombudsman of meetings I had with Google and Apple, where I... Uh, took uh, on behalf of all European countries uh, legal actions against them for not complying with European law uh, as regards to download of apps on Google Play and iTunes. And the first meeting, uh, they came with uh, six lawyers, but they were all from California. So I asked them if they were familiar with European law, and they said no, so we sent them back. Uh, and asked them to come <laughs> next week with some people who knew European law. And this was before Google and Spain. And, and we were actually, at the time, all my colleagues of the enforcement agencies across Europe were of the viewpoint that, of course, European law applies when you sell for about 10 billion euros annually to 600, uh, 360 million consumers in Europe, then you don't apply American law. But that was just to to wrap up on that session. Well, that's not what I'm going to speak about. I'm going to speak to you about the case uh, Tele 2 Sverige, uh, uh, the judgment from the court from December last year. I was advocate general in the case and presented my conclusions in July last, uh, in 2016 and uh, six months before the judgment. So I'm going to speak about security versus uh, data protection, but I will also touch upon some international private law, so I've chosen to speak about a case uh, concerning the uh, applicable law and consumer contracts uh, case uh, concerning Amazon here in Luxembourg, uh, which I'll come back to in the second round. The first case, Etil uh, 2 Sverige uh, and, and, uh, and, and Watson, uh, was a follow-up from Digital Rights Ireland. In, uh, you remember in 2014, the court uh, annulled the directive on uh, data retention regime that was provided for in, in the directive. And the reason was that it went beyond what was strictly necessary uh, and did not comply with the, with, the, um, with the fundamental rights, especially Article 7 and 8 in the European Charter of Fundamental Rights. 
The problem was that there was a general scheme of data retention and there were no safeguards. So there were no provision providing for who could have access to this kind of data, for what purposes, and, and all the security to keep the data uh, correctly stored. And what data are we talking about? We're talking about uh, uh, use of a mobile phone. And I suppose most of you have your mobile phone here today, so we will be able to see that you've been here today. We will also know who you've been phoning, at what time, uh, and who you sent SMS to. That's the kind of uh, data that telephone companies keep to uh, send an invoice. Uh, and that's interesting data for police enforcement because it enables them to find out uh, a lot about uh, the past. Uh, let's take a few examples. Uh, the, uh, the guy who committed the terrorist attack in Nice was not known to the police beforehand, but with this register, the police were able to see who had been phoning beforehand, where did he get his arms, uh, the truck, and so forth. Another example could be uh, the telephone that was found in the uh, garbage can outside Bataclan uh, in Paris. Uh, with a, with a, such a data retention regime, you could see that this telephone was located in, uh, a week before in a certain apartment in Saint-Denis, northern Paris, and that's interesting to the police, of course to find uh, people who have helped the terrorists. It can be a murder case. We have a case in Denmark at the moment where uh, we just found the body. Uh, it was a year ago that the murder took place, and now it's interesting to see what mobile phones were in that area at that particular time. So there's no, uh, no, no, no question that this is a very interesting uh, uh, regime. But after the Digital Rights Island judgment, the question arise, did that mean that all the national laws implementing the directive were also contrary to fundamental rights? Because what you could see in the national laws that there were safeguards. There were not maybe not sufficient safeguards, but there were safeguards uh, in, in this particular case concerned the British and the Swedish legislation. To be quite brief, I think that the Swedish legislation was more or less okay. The British was uh, lacking a little behind, uh, to put it uh, diplomatic. I want to enlighten you a little about some of the 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 the, the recent the the, the uh, some of the the thoughts we had in my cabinet uh, when drawing up the conclusions and why I reached the conclusions that I uh, that I did that I think that a data a general data regime is permissible if there are sufficient safeguards in it. Well, first of all, the, the, uh, and then uh, speak a little briefly about also the court's judgment. I've already mentioned some of the advantages of having a, a general scheme of data retention. Of course, there are dangers as well. It gives a lot of insight of people's behavior in the past. Uh, I think it could be interesting to know if people have called a defense lawyer uh, maybe several times during a week, or a psychiatrist could be interesting to know as well. So there would be, there would be uh, a lot of information uh, stocked here also on, on, uh, on daily habits. So of course there is, uh, at, at, you, you have to uh, balance the security issue with uh, the right to private life and, and data protection in, in the charter. Now, my view reading of the Digital Rights Island was that it was a combination of lack of safeguards that made the, the court strike down the directive. Um, but there was one point in Digital Rights Island, point 59, that caused some problems because it was said there that you, you need to, you cannot, or maybe it was said like that, but, but it is a requirement to delimit beforehand uh, who you're looking for, geographically, persons, time, and so forth. And that leads immediately to the question, are we only surve making surveillance of Molenbeek or not Excel in Brussels? Uh, could we know beforehand that the terrorists that who committed 9-11 were from a chic neighborhood in Hamburg? Uh, how do you make this kind of uh, delimitation? Does it create some sort of discrimination, uh, could you ask? Um, the Estonian government at the oral hearing made a very strong point saying if you make this kind of delimitation, you just change the habits of the people who are going to commit crimes. So they will move away or they will use another mean of communication. 
And there was a second thing that was interesting to learn is that the Conseil d'État in France had made a study looking at 59 in uh, point 59 in digital rights island saying if we if we take that literally and have to make this delimitation then not only do we have loopholes in the the registry but we will also be handicapped in looking into the future because if we can make a surveillance of everybody without knowing beforehand is then a committed crime then we can see different patterns and then we might be able to predict uh, new terrorist attacks or other serious crimes and there were actually no country in Europe who had a delimitation at that time. I asked even the German government has the strictest rule in German and they, they said, no, we have a, a general scheme, but we keep it only for uh, 10 weeks. So my, my with, with all this adding up, I thought, well, maybe that's not the real problem here that we, uh, that we hold on to data that is already there in the phone companies, but we need to have safeguards. We need to have, uh, we need to delimit to serious crimes. Uh, we need to make sure who has access to it. There should be a prior review, so a judge makes, uh, gives access. Uh, I did not I was not precise on how long we could keep the data, but uh, maybe six months is okay, according to adjustment from the Strasbourg court. And of course, you need also to be aware of the security. Where do we keep the data? Uh, with the Swede, though, the Swedish model was lacking a little bit because they had very strong rules, strict rules in Sweden, but they were not sure that the data was actually in Sweden. So it doesn't really uh, matter so much. Now, the court uh, went another path uh, and said, well, the the, uh, the directive from 2002-58 that you all know, uh, uh, Article 15, uh, that, that, that is a directive on, on uh, that you should delete this data, in telef uh, the telephone company should delete the data as soon as they don't need it anymore, so it's very, very rapidly. But there is a derogation, member state can, can ask them to keep onto it if it is to combat serious crimes. I read this provision as a possibility to have a general scheme. The court read it differently and said, well, in light of the provisions in the Charter, Article 7 and 8, it goes beyond what is strictly necessary. So it, it actually goes from a derogation to the main rule, uh, which was not permissible. And the court says that it goes on what is strictly necessary because you're looking at everybody without having any idea of whether they're going to commit a crime or not. And that's not permissible. But you can have a targeted measure. Uh, so you can, if you delimit beforehand, you can, you can have such a scheme. Now, we're not talking about that you already have names of persons who think that you're looking for, because then you can get a court order and actually also listen to what they say and what they, what they write, and you can put them under surveillance. So it's not that kind of, of, of knowledge. It's something in between of having no knowledge and all and more specific knowledge. Uh, I think we have to see how this is going to be implemented in national law. I've seen that the, our, well, the, Danish, the Ministry of Justice in the country where I come from, the Danish Ministry of Just, uh, Justice, has said he's going to pre present uh, to Parliament a new legislation in February. I'm, I'm very eager to see how he, he complies with, with the judgment on this point. I said I was going to see if I have time, to, uh, just uh, they be very short uh, uh, judgment. Uh, that uh, and and if you go away from here, I think one thing you can take with you is always look at point 59, uh, because point 59 is also very interesting in a court's judgment in um, in uh, Verein for Konsumenten Information, uh, which was a, a case handled down by the court in 2016. Also, in this case, I had the privilege of, of drawing up conclusions. And I'll come back to point 59. Um, the, 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 uh, the, um, the question was quite simple. Amazon, when you deal with Amazon in Europe, they uh, oblige you to accept that Luxembourg law is applicable to the contract. Now, is that permissible? This, I've looked some figures and it turns out if you take a three month period, 45% of the European population have done business on the internet, have bought something on the internet. So it's, it's, it's huge. And it's not, it, it, it does matter whether if we take an Austrian consumer, which was the case here, has to comply 
uh, has to know Luxembourg law when they, when they deal with Amazon, or they can use Austrian law, which they're more familiar with. Now, what I will go briefly over the Rome 1 and 2 uh, dispute, because that's not so interesting, and go straight to the interpretation of Article 6 in the Rome 1 regulation. What does it say? Well, it says that Amazon has to respect, as a point of depart, Austrian law because they address the activities towards Austria in German. But they can. They can say that Luxembourg's law is applicable, provided that they mention that the Austrian consumer can invoke mandatory rules. Now, here, 59 comes into play. Because in 59, it is added, provided that Austrian law gives a better protection. Now, imagine that you buy a camera. You pay, I don't know how many euros, but not that much. Or some music things on, on Amazon. And then, as an Austrian consumer, to invoke Austrian law, then you have that you're more familiar with, then you will have to prove that Austrian law gives a better protection than Luxembourg's law. I think there are not many, many Austrian consumers who are able to tell you that beforehand, before they buy the camera. There are probably not many Austrian judges who can say anything about this. Uh, so you need an expert to draw up, and now the cost of that will probably exceed the amount of uh, the, the price of the camera by far. So I think here we have maybe, if you look into the future, created a little bit of a problem that, that the mandatory rules that should be able to be invoked as Austrian rules can only be so if you can prove that they are better than, than the, the, the Luxembourgish rule. There are two problems uh, with that. We have a lot of minimum directives in this area, which means there are differences. Uh, but so, so there can be difference on many levels. So, so how do we, make, do we make a global view? Do we, do we see that generally Austrian law is better? Or is it only on certain points it needs to be better? So there are some open questions for future cases here. And uh, another problem is that even though you have uh, total harmonization, uh, so you, which the Consumer uh, Rights Directive is total harmonization, would, would, would that change the, uh, the, the uh, appreciation of article or the interpretation of Article 6, Paragraph 2 in the, in the Rome uh, 2 uh, regulation? I think I have used uh, my time. Uh, if there are any questions, of, I'll be very happy to take them. Thank you. Okay, hello everybody, I'm Gloria, and uh, I was told I have five minutes to tell you my perspective on the future challenges of the internet or something like this. So it's, it's going to be a bit uh, difficult, but I, uh, um, I would try to raise two points before that, uh, just to explain, I was not planning to, to discuss um, digital retention, I thought it was a, a good summary, just perhaps because I come from Barcelona, and trying to forget that I come from Barcelona for a while. I'm concentrating on the fact that I am based in Brussels and just in defense of the people of Molenbeek, of course, having a surveillance a retention of the data of everybody in Molenbeek is not targeted surveillance. Do we agree on this? It's not targeted surveillance in the sense that the court is uh, requiring this targeting to be related to uh, the, the, the some uh, factual relation with the possibility to commit a crime, uh, just to, to in my solidarity with the habitants, the population of Molenbeek, they are still innocent, most of them. So this was the uh, one, one thing. Uh, the other thing, uh, so I would like to discuss just two sort of conceptual issues related to, to the to data protection law. And then at the end, if I still have time, say something about um, the right to be delisted that was mentioned, the right to be forgotten. Normally, when, when I discuss this right, I don't make any new friends. So I will try to, to leave it uh, to the end. But uh, yes, we, we will see. Uh, the, the two conceptual things that I wanted to discuss for me are, are, are two of the main the key paradoxes of data protection law that we have, and they're very much influencing the, the, the future challenges of also international uh, private law in, in the cyberspace. And this one relates to the fact that I think it's, it's very close to, to Dan's uh, reflections on territoriality, but it's about the, the, the fact, it's about data location, and the other paradox relates to data transfers. The paradox about data location is for that for European data protection law, data location is at the same time 
irrelevant and very relevant. It depends of, of, the, of the context. It is completely irrelevant, and this is uh, perhaps a way to escape this territoriality trend towards ter ter territoriality, is that it is irrelevant to determine, of course, the applicability of uh, the directive, the applicability of the, the future regulation. We don't apply uh, the regulation in the future, but we will not apply it because data are supposed to be in the European Union. There are all the criteria, but it, it is not about uh, where whether the data are in the European Union or where in the European Union are the data. I think the, the slogan that, first that, that better describes the relation between EU data protection law and the location of data is this uh, American policy doctrine uh, about don't ask, don't tell. Where are my data? Don't ask, don't tell. If they are somewhere in the, in the European Union, let the data flow and uh, that's, uh, that will be fine. And there's a uh, very clear um, judgment about this. It's the, uh, the other tele two, uh, another tele two judgment about uh, the consent of people. So it was mentioned also by, by Dan, uh, consent, informed consent is a uh, Core, a cornerstone of uh, European data protection law. This idea that you have to consent to some, pro you can consent to some processing if you are informed of the nature of, of, of that processing. And in this teleto judgment, it was about whether people, uh, about people who consent to their data being uh, shared in public directories, the, the data, the telecommunications data. And the court said, well, if you consent that a company takes your data for that purpose, you, get, you don't have to be asked again if uh, another company comes and if that company comes from another member state. So if you consent, you, you have to be informed about what you're consenting for, but you, you cannot pretend that, ah, I don't want my data to cross this border of to another member state. So data have to flow. We, we don't care about where are the data, except, of course, and this is the paradox, when data cross a border and they go outside of the European Union. So think about this. We don't want to know whether the data are inside of the European Union, where are the data, but then if data cross the border, we, it's, it's very important because then we have all the, the rules that apply for data transfers. And this takes me to the second paradox, which actually was also mentioned before. We don't know what it's a data transfer. Actually, what we know is that the data transfer is, in most of the cases, not a transfer. And this is, I want you to, to think about this. Uh, so what is a transfer? A transfer is, of course, you take something and you move it. And we know that if only exceptionally nowadays we move, we transfer data by moving data in the same way that we, when I send an email, I never send an email. Uh, we are, we send, you, you, you used to send letters, so I send the letter. When I send an email, I, my email gets copied a number of, of times so that I, I don't even know how many. When we transfer data, it's not that the data move from A to B, it's that data are copied. They will be in A, they will be in B, they will probably be in C and many other places. So we are trying to regulate data transfers in the cyberspace, but not with the right words. And, and we have to take into account that indeed data have not been transferred. They, they are still in the other place where possibly they have to be protected uh, through, through other rules. So this, this is for me one of the, yes, one of the, the key uh, difficulties of thinking about future challenges. How do we, do we recognize that we're trying to, to regulate something that we don't know where it, where it is, but sometimes it matters where it is. And uh, we claim that it moves, but actually it just uh, multiplies. And this relates, uh, brings me to, to this last point of the right to be delisted. As I mentioned, I'm, I'm, I normally feel very alone when I, when I talk about my views on the, the right to be delisted. I already felt very alone before the, the, the judgment in Google Spain, because I, I claim that actually if there was a possibility that under Article 8 of the Charter of the European Union, we had a right to be delisted, that it made sense. And it was not a popular idea before the judgment came. It, it is still not a popular idea, actually, that this judgment makes sense. I hope somebody in Luxembourg believes, agrees with me, that the judgment uh, makes some sense. Uh, normally, yes, it's very rare that somebody agrees with this, but I, I would still uh, like to, to say this. Uh, I do believe in, in the Neil's position. I think it, it makes sense to, to, to if we agree that a certain processing uh, is not lawful, because the balancing of a commercial interest with the rights of the data subject does not make sense then and, and in producing a certain a certain um, uh, uh, in a certain context we cannot agree that this uh, uh, processing will be lawful for in uh, australia so 
what I'm <laughs> what the link with all the previous things that I've been saying is not about where are the data, it's about uh, the processing that we are trying to regulate. So the GDPR, the directive, are about regulating the processing of data, data that we may not, not know where we are. And then the, qu the qu question is, what is the processing that we are concerned with? In the Google Spain uh, judgment, it is question of the right to be delisted, of your results not being shown on the internet. Actually, it's the processing by Google, the internal processing, that, that is not lawful. It is not about the, the end of the moment where the data are shown as a Google result. It is not about the harm, just coming back to, to Dan, where you, you mentioned we could have a layer approach saying perhaps if the harm is, uh, uh, if, if my information is just shown to Australians, my harm is not that uh, strong because I'm living in Brussels. It is not about this harm. It is very clear in the judgment of, of, the, of the court. The harm doesn't matter. You don't need to have a harm. If the processing by uh, the, the company is not lawful, things uh, stop there. And, and, and this, in practice, there is a right to be delisted because the, the process is not lawful. So this is one of some of the subjects that I would be glad to, to discuss. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I would now give the floor to Kevin Benish, who will take up a little bit what has been said already, but he takes up takes it up from the American perspective. So Microsoft is your topic. Great, thanks so much. Again, my name is Kevin Benish. I'm with the New York University School of Law, and I just want to briefly take five seconds of my five minutes to say thank you to the Max Planck Institute and to the organizers of this, of this conference. This is really fantastic and I really think we need this exact same sort of dialogue to take place on the other side of the Atlantic because it is so fruitful and so important. Um, I'm here to talk about the future challenges of jurisdiction and choice of law in cyberspace. And the, the biggest challenge, and I think uh, Professor Fuster and I and many other speakers can agree the future challenge is how territoriality works in this space. But uh, my goal is to actually take us a step back and say that it's not even so much that territoriality doesn't work in cyberspace, it's that at least when it comes to the United States and to the European Union and to member states in the European Union, Unfortunately, courts and practitioners are not even talking about territoriality in the same way. And so I'm just going to spend most of my time highlighting how territoriality works in the United States and how courts are grappling with it. So we can hopefully open a dialogue of how we can move toward harmonizing our perspectives on territoriality, which as pri private international lawyers, you know, that one of the goals is always harmonization and reducing the friction that we've identified. And from my perspective, uh, the best way to do that at, at the present moment is to try and come together in how we understand how territoriality functions. Um, although I'm very sympathetic to the views that have been espoused today of how territoriality just does not work in the context of cyberspace. I just should briefly point out that it's been three instances within the past seven years alone that the United States Supreme Court has really made clear that territoriality is here to stay, at least from the US perspective. So for better or worse, it's not something that we can just ignore. So with, with that, uh, the United States right now, there is a case currently uh, going on that uh, was mentioned already involving Microsoft uh, and a, a warrant under the Stored Communications Act um, that is seeking to, from within the United States, obtain data stored in Ireland. Uh, that case began in December of 2013 when a judge authorized a warrant. Microsoft happily provided the data that was technically stored in the United States, but then respectfully said no thank you and then moved to quash the rest of the subpoena which demanded that Microsoft hand over the data that everyone agreed was stored on a server in Ireland. And that was because when they did a search they realized the email address to which this whole dispute was related, and this was a criminal proceeding, the email address was registered to a, a zip code and address in Ireland. And so therefore, because of the way cloud computing works, most of the data was actually stored on a server in Ireland because it would be closer to where the, the email address and the person allegedly live. So the court took this up and analyzed the whole framework of the Stored Communications Act, which is the, the federal US law under which the government was seeking to obtain this information under what's known as the presumption against extraterritoriality, which really is how the United States when analyzing federal US law, 
understands territorial versus extraterritorial applications. Now, the presumption against extraterritoriality has really come in very full force over the past seven years, and it involves a two-step analysis. First, a court will look at whatever federal law is being invoked to determine whether or not the United States Congress has espoused a very clear intent that the United States law should be applied to have effect outside of the United States. If it doesn't have that clear intent, which often many laws do not, because as there have been many instances uh, demonstrated through a lot of United States cases, Congress is not the best at drafting laws all the time. Um, so often courts have to move to what's known as step two. And in step two, courts have to determine whether or not the application of law is actually domestic, so within the United States, or if it's actually an extraterritorial and therefore impermissible application of the law, essentially because Congress did not intend the law to apply abroad unless they made it clear at step one. And they determine if the law applies domestically by looking at the quote unquote focus of the statute. And the focus is really the court identifying what the statute is meant to regulate. And it's wherever that instance occurs, the subject of the regulation, that is the essential locus of whether or not a statute is extraterritorial or territorial. Applying this framework, the government argued that, there, no one argued that the law applied extraterritorial. It was very, it was very clear that it, this whole thing hinged on step two, that is whether or not the seizure of this data occurred in the United States or whether or not it occurred in Ireland. Everyone agreed that the law on its face did not apply extraterritorially. Microsoft, seeking to quash the warrant, argued that the focus of the statute was on privacy interests and therefore the act and the focus of the statute actually occurred in Ireland, which means that it was extraterritorial and therefore impermissible. The United States government argued that the focus of the statute was actually on where information was disclosed. So in the view of the United States government, so long as you can seize data from anywhere on earth, but it's not viewed until it's in the United States, it's all perfectly legal. Now, um, this has worked its way up, uh, and at the Second Circuit Court of Appeals in New York, the, a three-member panel determined that it was impermissibly extraterritorial because the focus of the statute was on a user's privacy interests, and thus they ruled with Microsoft. Now, this is a very narrow interpretation of what is territorial versus extraterritorial, and although it in my opinion, it's flawed because it's subject to arbitrary line drawing of what the quote unquote focus of a statute is. It is something that is more readily identifiable than the current European approach to territoriality in the data context, which again is interesting because it's much broader than the US approach. And I just, someone had mentioned the, uh, what I call the Google France case that was recently referred to the uh, Court of Justice of the European Union, uh, in which the French Data Protection Authority has urged a global delisting uh, is necessary under the right to be forgotten. Uh, in that decision, which has since been referred, uh, the, the French Data Protection Authority actually stated that even though it was requiring a global delisting, it was still a territorial application of the law because the fundamental right underlying the right to be forgotten was so essential that there could be no way to evade it. And this, again, th I, I don't have an answer at this time, but I just want to highlight in, in the hopes of starting a dialogue and finding a way to harmonize that this is just a vastly different and broader approach to what we consider to be territorial versus extraterritorial um, than what we see in the United States. And hopefully we can, I think as private international lawyers, it's very important to find a way to start to bridge the divide. Thank you very much for demonstrating to us this interesting case and the concept of uh, the presumption against extraterritoriality, which to my opinion really has changed the legal situation in the US and uh, maybe they are now much more cautious than we are here in Europe and this is uh, something to be reflected. Our last 
discussion uh, will take up an additional dimension which has already been mentioned from time to time this afternoon. Uh, this is not Luxembourg, it's Strasbourg and the case law of uh, the Strasbourg court regarding the protection of privacy. Christina, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Hess. And before I start, I would like to extend my gratitude to you and to Professor Kuhner for giving me the opportunity to speak today before such a distinguished audience. It's, uh, it's a great opportunity and it's wonderful to be back. Uh, as Professor Hess just mentioned, I would like to briefly walk you through the uh, interpretation that the European Court of Human Rights has given of Article 8 of the Convention uh, of the European Convention on Human Rights. As you certainly know, Article 8 actually is meant to protect the right to private and family life, but the um, European Court of Human Rights um, was actually proved to be instrumental, remarkably instrumental, in ensuring uh, that within the scope of this provision also be included the protection of personal data. Uh, why is that and why was that so important? Because when we talk about um, cyberspace and personal data, the first thing the non-technical user, as I myself may be, but perhaps many people are, is that the mind goes to the internet. But the internet is not the only context where the protection of personal data arises as a potential problem, because certainly um, the protection of personal data becomes extremely sensitive and important in the relationships that the individual has with public authorities, because there's the risk, of course, of arbitrary treatment of um, personal data. And the U European Court of Human Rights has gone the extra mile to remind um, national courts and public authorities that data protection, just like privacy, just like private life and family life, is meant to have an impact. The treatment of data protection is meant to have an impact on the individual's quality of life. And when we talk about individual in this case, of course we mean a, a natural person, a physical person, not a more or legal person, and this is also um, been made clear recently in a judgment which is not on data protection, it's on privacy, and that's MTE um, versus Hungary. The fact that uh, no matter what, privacy, including data protection, are an expression of a quality of life meant as a dignity and meant as an expression of personality. Now, anticipating a little bit my conclusions, I'd like to say that the European Court of Human Rights has has proven remarkably instrumental, not only in ensuring uh, that mm, personal data be protected against arbitrary treatment. I have to say the cases, most of the cases and most of the decisions per se are not necessarily groundbreaking per se. However, the court has proven us absolutely instrumental in modernizing um, the text of a convention that was drafted at a time where the technological advancements that we have seen in the past 20 years were not even thinkable. And just to give you an idea of some of the um, statements that the court has made with respect in particular to storage and use of data in the context of computerized and automi automized um, systems, the court has reminded, has clarified that for the information to fall within the scope of Article 8, it does not need to be private, it does not need to be confidential, sorry. To the contrary, it suffices that the information be systematically collected and stored in official files for Article 8 to apply, and that's a very strong protection. Also, as the court has emphasized, the necessity for a proper legal framework becomes all the more vital if data are processed automatically. So you see the, att the attention, the care that the court places on the issue of automatization, where data is automatically uh, or um, by computer collected and stored, a higher degree of scrutiny must be put in place in order to make sure that personal data is indeed protected. With respect in particular to personal data and um, storage and use, Article 8 has been interpreted by the court to encompass aspects of collection, storage, use, disclosure, access, as well as erasure or destruction of personal data. And you may be interested in knowing that among the areas in which a violation has been indeed ascertained by the court are DNA information and fingerprints, health data and medical records, interception of communications, phone tapping, and secret surveillance, monitoring of 
monitoring of employees' computers, and use of photo and video surveillance. Um, I, sorry, I'll be brief. Article 8 seems to be worded in a way to suggest that a right against interferences as such is focused on the negative obligations that the provision entails, meaning abstain from interference. But it is interesting um, to note that uh, actually in the court's understanding, um, the provision provides a corresponding right to an adequate regulatory framework, which is commonly at the core of the court's reasoning. So the, the question of what is the obligation, the obligation is not merely a negative one, the obligation placed on states and placed on public authorities. The obligation is indeed a negative one, but it is also a positive one. And this becomes really clear in the court's legal reasoning. Um, I have, of course, provided an overview of past cases, although most of them are actually quite recent. But because I was asked also to look into the future, I would like to share, um, because I think it's, not, it's noteworthy, uh, that two um, cases are currently pending before the court, and they touch upon an issue that has never been addressed by the court before. And this tells us, of course, this does not come as a surprise, but this confirms that the question of the protection of data protection is far from being uh, over, uh, it's far from being um, already um, exhaustively addressed. These two cases uh, actually address the question of data storage by te telecommunication service providers, and um, they are currently pending before the court. One application tackles the question of whether the obligation under German law that telecommunication providers um, store personal details of all their customers is in accordance with Article 8. And the other one concerns the power that the police of Montenegro enjoys to directly access uh, in an allegedly uncontrolled manner all the data stored by a mobile telecommunication provider and whether this is in compliance with Article 8. And it's interesting that actually two cases are uh, submitted, are lodged on precisely this very issue uh, at present. Um, of course, uh, I look forward to updating you in due course, possibly on these cases, and I welcome, I thank you for the attention, and I welcome your questions and comments. Thank you very much. Now we have one moment maybe for reactions also between the panelists and then I think we should open the floor for general questions and comments. Maybe I would like to react to your second case, Advocate General, uh, the remark concerning Article 6 of the Rome 1 regulation. I do share your concern in this regard. I think this is a really complicated provision which might work when you have a consumer association bringing a case like VKI, but apart from that, it is very complicated. We have made a study here at the Institute concerning consumer uh, protection, especially when it comes to, uh, to litigation, and one concern we raised was exactly Article 6, which uh, is uh, very well meant, very nice from the perspective of private international law, but much too complicated. But uh, it has been discussed uh, for intensively in Brussels when Rome 1 was uh, enacted, and uh, I don't see that it will be changed in, uh, in the close future, unfortunately. But this is sometimes uh, uh, the case with provisions which are well meant, but maybe not uh, functioning as they should was not a question, rather a reaction to uh, what you have said. Is here anybody who would like to say anything in addition? So maybe we, we, turn, to we turn to the audience. Your question, please. Thank you. Yes, yeah, sorry, just about the point you just raised. Um, the Commission, in its proposal, for the Rome 1 regulation did actually uh, 
propose to get rid of this uh, sort of uh, dépassage and simply say that where the, where the consumer protective provisions applied, it would be the law of the consumer, uh, consumer's home country that applied to avoid all these problems. But it became, uh, in particular for the sort of seller's lobby, a real sort of uh, affaire d'état to preserve this uh, possibility of uh, party autonomy, which, as you rightly say, leads to something of a mess. Um, in, and in the, uh, the Amazon case, what Amazon were doing, of course, was perfectly permissible. Uh, what the, the focus of the attack was, was that uh, simply saying Luxembourg law is applicable. It wasn't inaccurate, but it was misleading because it didn't give the whole picture. And uh, so, as well as bringing in private international law, you actually had to bring in the consumer protection law and the um, unfair term and unfair contract terms act to to actually attack the provision. Perhaps doesn't do much, but at least it may flag up to the consumer that uh, some other law may be applicable. I would like. To thank you very much for uh, reminding us of that uh, aspect. It, it is completely correct that it only set Luxembourg law without mentioning. The, the possibility of invoking mandatory rules of your own country. Uh, and that, that was, the, the argument from the Amazon side, if I remember correctly, was that they didn't need to do so because it was already provided for in Rome 1. So everybody could read that in Rome 1 uh, regulation. I, I doubt that very many people know Rome 1, except probably people in this room, but, but not out on the street. And there's another aspect that I forgot to mention which adds up, um, uh, and it, you're also right that it was a bit more complicated with the, the unfair terms uh, uh, directive, which by way is a minimum directive, so there you, you, you have the, the problem in full scale. But there's another thing that is interesting to keep in mind. We're talking about uh, purchases of a small amount, and most of these disputes are settled out of court in the, uh, according to the ADR directive. Now, so there's a harmonization of complaint boards, out of court complaint boards. And I don't think that, that there is the expertise in those complaint boards to make this comparison uh, on, on uh, different laws. So what will actually be the practical consequence here is that that's a fear that, that the consumers, even though they have the right in Rome 2, uh, sorry, room one, they will never be able to invoke it because they have to prove that it gives them better, that the own country gives them better right than, than what Amazon has decided. So, so we w in practical terms, it would be Luxembourg law in the ADR. I, I, that's, uh, I think, uh, could be the consequences of, of uh, this point in the judgment. Thank you. Gerald Spindler. Just a short question uh, related to the data retention issues, but it was more or less for all the panel, but it's spe uh, specifically going to you. Um, sometimes I'm a little bit worried about that all this data retention discussion is more later related to public security issues, police, etc. And you mentioned that yourself, and you also in this Montenegro case, etc. Um, and frankly, I got the impression that, or the idea that uh, the European Court of Justice ruling had strongly been influenced by the German Constitutional Court ruling before one year. The arguments were more or less identically uh, be between the courts. However, the German Constitutional Court did not really address, and neither the European Court of Justice, private law. So what about enforcement against, for example, copyright infringers? I have to get the data, the data about their identity, et cetera, which should then be revealed by host providers, for example, or access providers. And if they are not obliged in any way to keep the data, I have no chance as the victim to get the infringer, the real infringer. The German Constitution Court just touched that and, and just one, two, three phrases, and there's nothing, as far as I remember, in the European Court of Justice ruling, okay, because it was not the case, but it strongly affects all kind of private law enforcement issues. How, how, what, 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 do you, what is your thinking or your thoughts about that? 
I think actually there, there is something in your opinion. No, it relates to the seriousness of, of the of the of the crime. Uh, if I, my memories are, are good, so it, the, the, the yes, this is why this is why uh, the it, the idea would be that such a serious interference with the fundamental rights cannot be justified if it's something different than a serious crime. So this is why all the other um, issues are not considered because. Data retention, the, the proportionality of data retention is argued on the basis that it's against uh, terrorism, against serious crime. That's my perspective. I think you have a very, very interesting point here. And I think you can add to what you just said, the e-commerce directive, which gives, uh, which, which, which has these uh, hosting rules. Uh, I think it's article 14, 15 and 14, 15, uh, where the only person responsible is the act, the, act the, 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 the guy who committed the infringement, uh, the copyright infringement, so you cannot, and also in the light of Google France case, go after the, the hosting uh, companies. So th th that is a real issue, is that you, you, it, it is very, very difficult to make the private enforcement against uh, infringement of copyrights if you don't have this data. Uh, that's that's uh, obvious. So um, I don't think we have a a clear solution to that. Uh, I think it, one of the things that struck my, my Polish colleague is Maciek Spunar had conclusions in, in a case where the, the, the question uh, was whether you could oblige um, the, the uh, for example, the owner of a cafe uh, where, where they have free internet, free Wi-Fi, that they make registration uh, of people's names and address, passports, and so so you know after if you can detect an internet infringement to that particular site afterwards, then you you know who has been been used uh, while they were eating a sandwich. The the internet. Uh, well, his opinion was that you cannot apply uh, uh, internet cafes to to do that. I think the court uh, went more strict in terms that you you can actually do it because there you also had. Uh, the different uh, conflicting uh, rules in the charter, so 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 you must be able to to, to combat that. So there might be a solution to uh, to the, but we definitely haven't seen the last case in this area yet. So uh, I, I I spoke about this in Paris, and my hotel was uh, precisely 25 cafes. Uh, between my hotel and the conference rooms, and I, every time I passed the cafe, I said, "Poor guy, he has now to register everybody who's who's using his internet." But uh, I think that's the only possibility solution we have at the moment. We have two additional. Just allow me to take advantage of uh, Professor Benis's presence. Uh, I had to I had to look it up. In 2012, the a, the American Bar Association issued uh, a rule uh, asking the uh, United States courts. I uh, have to read it to consider and respect as appropriate the data protection and privacy laws of any applicable foreign sovereign with regard to data sought in discovery in civil litigation. Um, so I have to uh, ask, like you know, it's a question that was apparently. Uh, uh, based on a Supreme Court ruling in Aero Spaciale. Uh, have there been any evolutions in that particular domain in, in terms of foreign adjudication? That's a really great question, and I'm really glad you asked because that was basically the second half of my <laughs> five-minute talk. So uh, it's a really great question. Um, Aero Spaciale really has not been addressed, um, really, in any substantive way by the Supreme Court, and it's even not very common among the circuit courts of appeals. But what's interesting about this issue uh, is that I do expect it to become um, a more litigated one, especially after the uh, GDPR does take effect, given the sanctions that can be imposed. And of course, given the very, as everyone here I'm sure knows, the very generous discovery rules that we enjoy in the United States. Um, the, the reason I think it will become more litigated is because Obviously, there will be more tension, but also because the issue is somewhat different in terms of the territorial limits of discovery rules. Um, they're not subject necessarily to the same limitation that federal US law is. So the whole presumption against extraterritoriality that I discussed in the Microsoft case, it's not clear how that would apply in, a, in 
an instance where discovery rules uh, or the federal rules of civil procedure are um, being discussed. So I think that you could see uh, very, very easily, especially once these sanction levels ra uh, get ratcheted up, uh, the whole issue of area spatial being litigated more in the courts. But at, at the moment, no, we haven't really seen anything along those lines. Your question, please. <coughs> With coming back on the comment also of Professor Spindler, uh, what I know from, and coming back again to the data retention case, Hilke Heimans, uh, what I note is that data retention was essentially about an obligation of a, uh, of for uh, private companies to, to retain certain specific data, certain data, which they otherwise, under data production law, to, to protect fundamental rights were obliged to to delete, so it's an exception to to a fundamental right. That's what we are talking about, and it would really, I would really be surprised with this, that you have this exception for really serious crime. But if you b oblige companies, for instance, to, to keep data for the case that at a certain moment someone's private or someone's intellectual property rights were are uh, infringed, I think that would be really something which, for in my idea at least, would be definitely disproportional in the terms of when talking about infringing or uh, infringing, f breaching fundamental rights. That brings me about fundamental rights to one thing about territoriality. Uh, the question which we face now in, Google, in the new Google, Google case is about how far can Europe indeed go in protecting its fundamental rights? And by doing so, uh, really our act is worldwide and ask Google to worldwide delete certain data as a as its only means as a pos possibly its only means to protect effectively its own inf fundamental rights. That's the question. Maybe the the link between fundamental rights, human rights protection on the one hand, and territoriality at the other ha other hand. Sorry, I just want to respond quickly because I think that's very insightful and. I think it's a great point. The only slight rebuttal I would have is at, at the same time, and I'm of course very sympathetic to the point you just made, but in the United States, the First Amendment and freedom of expression would be, at least in US courts, be considered to be fundamental to the same extent. And we've seen litigation over this in previous cases. I think it was in 2004 when the Yahoo case was decided um, and someone got a judgment in France and then sought to have that judgment recognized regarding the sale of Holocaust paraphernalia on eBay. They sought to have it taken down and they went to the United States and they went to California and I believe eBay raised the First Amendment as its fundamental right and people should have the right to sell what they want. And it was a very fractured decision but the US courts were not going to recognize the French judgment of you know the right to take that down in that instance. So I think that we will probably see more clashes over what fundamental right will prevail in the courts, but it's um, just, a, again, it's just the other side of that coin. Can I say, say one word to, uh, to regard your, your, your comment, Hilke, about sort of the limits of, of territoriality? And this is uh, what, what Dan said uh, uh, in his talk made me uh, think of this. There's now at least one case where the European Commission is negotiating an adequacy decision under the data protection directive with a third country and I know the third country has said well uh, you don't quite understand we also have to find you adequate to receive data from us and I, 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 I expect this sort of reciprocity will become more common uh, as and we, we've certainly seen this uh, for example the the history of the US exerting its extraterritorial reach which happened in the 60s first under competition law third third countries learn from this and as, as Europe does this more and more there may be more third countries that, that do this to us to and what what will this mean how, how will we deal with this this is maybe a question more for the future but I think it's it's probably bound to to come up Gerald Spindler wanted to make a very short remark yes. 
Okay, just, just a short, quick reply. It's not only about copyright. It's all, uh, all kinds, let's say, of uh, infringements. For example, defamation, etc. So, But which doesn't reach the threshold of a serious crime or terror act. Could be defamation, as hate speech, and so on and so on. You always have this fundamental dilemma between anonymity on one side, no data retention, so you can't get the infringer, and you have the safe harbor privileges of the e-commerce directive. And this is a system of communicating tubes, and you see how courts are reacting across the European Union by invoking injunctions against access provider, for example. Is that something we really would, would like to have? Blocking websites and so on, and then you're transferring all these fundamental rights problems into another area, but you have the same problems there, because you have to strike a balance yeah, between freedom of speech, getting access to information, and on the other side, protecting uh, potential victims. This is also true with the European Court of Justice uh, invoked a late, uh, very strong access upon that there have to be at least fundamental rights, have to be at least some protection also of copyrights, for example. Yeah? You can read it very clearly in the uh, uh, UPC telecable case and the Megafadden case and so on and so on. And it's not only based upon the di enforcement directive, but also upon the European Charter of Fundamental Rights. And so I think we are really here in a total dilemma and unfortunately in data retention issues that's it's not really discussed now. Just briefly, I, I think many of the times we, we have these discussions about data retention, we, we fall into, into uh, this, uh, is it data retention, yes or not? And we know that in practice it can only be some data will be retained. And the question is which data? But uh, some of us, I think, when we say data retention, we think about data retention in the classic massive way, all data will be retained. I think that is a very, very, very serious interference with everybody's rights, and that's very, very difficult to, to balance. If it's the data or retaining th some data in some circumstances, some freezing of data, there are many, many technical uh, gray zones between one thing and the other, and that's what has to be explored. But if we think about data retention as a massive principle, everybody's data, be because in case of many, many, uh, uh, any bad thing that can happen, that's uh, an issue that we say, mm, the court has not said perhaps yet, but uh, it's, it's, it's a problem as such. We, but we, 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 we can discuss types of data retention, but with some, some retention of some data. That would be the, my answer. Yes, uh, all, all many possibilities, but data retention in a massive way, it's, it's, it's a huge problem. Any additional question at the moment? I don't see any hand, but I think this is also the good moment to close the conference of today. We have touched many, many aspects of data protection, cyber world, jurisdiction, applicable law, and we have not come to clear results. But I think this could not be expected because the challenges are really great. But what we have seen, and I think this was a very interesting aspect, is we have to look at old problems from new perspectives, and we have to go very, very close to, let's say, legal text practices, etc., in order to understand what is going on. In uh, this respect, I found uh, Heike Schweitzer's uh, approach to uh, the different contracts, uh, which are uh, concluded with those platforms, uh, quite interesting. And uh, at the same time, we are dealing with injunctions, uh, which are territorial limited, sometimes unlimited. There are questions of international law. There are questions also of procedural law. And uh, finally, fundamental freedoms, protection of the individual are key but difficult to make, and as it is so difficult, I now give the floor to Christopher Kula. I, I will say only two things be, be before we close this. First of all, I've learned now, whenever you, you get a, an advocate general opinion to read or a judgment, you need to go to paragraph 59, because there's <laughs> the, the court obviously has some secret which we, we haven't known till now, so look at paragraph 59. And secondly, I want to thank all of you and thank thank the the MPI and I, I think I can say with with some certainty this this won't be the last event that the Brussels Privacy Hub and the MPI do together uh, so thank you very much
uh, and we'll release you, I suppose, now into an, a nice reception. Indeed. So I join uh, Christopher in thanking you and also thanking uh, my team here. Uh, I would mention uh, Martina Mantovani, uh, who has uh, prepared the whole uh, Indeed, conference yes. with the help of the administration. And I would like to thank also Martina Winkel and Sabina Locrillo. So thank you very much for making, having made it possible. And I would also thank to all speakers and all of you who came to the Max Planck Institute. And uh, feel free to come again. So <laughs> wish you a nice evening.